So yes, hi and welcome to this talk about principles of effective developers. So this is going to be, I think, a very fun topic. Um, one I think that is very important and that is dear to my heart. So how to get more effective as developers and what that even means. My name is Sebastian, originally from uh, Munich, Germany, right? So that's also something uh, we Germans, uh, but also the Swiss are known for, right? To be efficient and to work more and all of these things. So my background is in Java, uh, as you can see here from the Java titles. Some of the things uh, I will uh, tell you just by Java examples, but this talk is not about Java per se. It's actually about any programming language or any IT, um, any tech that you work with as a developer. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. Also another fun fact, since two days or so, I started losing my voice, maybe as you can hear. So I hope it will last for 45 more minutes. Um, otherwise, yeah, I just have to live code without talking or something like that. So some principles of being effective. What does that mean? What I want to show you just with some examples and by experience are sort of principles, rough guidelines that when followed just make you more effective as a developer regardless of the language and regardless of the tools. So I will show you some examples but it's really not about hey use my tech stack and you will be you know successful. You can adapt this to any tools, to any IDEs of choice, to any operating system although there might be some things there. So yeah, let's right get into it. As the first principle that I want to uh, show you there of effective developers is to embrace automation. So while this sounds ob uh, first of all quite obvious, right? Like automation is something that we do all the time as developers. So when we program something that is per se automation, right? We write some code and the, so the computer runs our code. But if you think about it, what I mean with embrace is really all the big and small tasks that are somewhat tedious or repetitive or sort of boring that can be automated should be automated. And automation comes in very small forms as well. If you uh, think about it, for example, any keyboard shortcut that you do is already some sort of automation, right? Because you use a keyboard shortcut, a very small macro or helper, where otherwise you would need to wheel the mouse around to do uh, things like that. So just as an example for your IDE, I use my IDE of choice, that's IntelliJ. Um, what I do if I uh, just would like to create uh, some class here and say, for example, I would have to have some class here. Then it's, if you think about it, this is already some automation in a very tiny form, right? Because I didn't write package and so on and so forth. My coffee is my example project, public class, some class, but I let the IDE do this, right? And the same is true for these, uh, what are very helpful, what are called sometimes snippets or live templates in IntelliJ. When you say you can have public static void main or main and hit tab and auto expand that into, well, this so-called live templates that um, are shipped with, with a lot of Java examples, and you don't have to write this yourself. So what is the point? With the whole automation idea, well, besides artificial intelligence and recent development uh, is there, what I would like to, what I would uh, like you to think about is the separation of we humans are smart and creative, and the computer is not necessarily smart, actually not smart at all, but it's very fast and very reliable. So that is a very good combination if you do it right. So there are certain things that we should think about as humans, as developers, but then the implementation or the actually action should be done by the computer. What do I mean by that? If I say I would like to have a main method, then I don't need to remember public, static, void, main and all of these things. I can just do this faster. I can get the point across faster. Same if you want to have the, well, if you write it correctly, if you want a typical hello world example, so you can have some certain shortcuts. So the first takeaway is to, well, just remind yourself that there are certain things in your IDE that, uh, that can help you, certain features. Here I wanted to point out the live templates, but don't stop there. What I want you uh, to have is to raise some awareness for this topic so that every time you now look into your projects with the technologies you work with or maybe some specific boilerplate code, you can go and define your own live templates. And that's actually a really good idea. So for example, in uh, if I work in Enterprise Java, I have a lot of these sort of uh, things that I throw some annotations on my code like add application scope or I would like to uh, inject something here. And what typically always happens, and this is sort of what I'm getting at, is if I say, if I sh start typing here, you know, I, I need to type at and then uppercase I and G and uh, J and so on and so forth and, you know, select the correct one. 
and that always that, that takes away a little bit of mental energy that makes you less effective right so because you already made the decision i would like to inject some bean that is on the application scope whatever that means and then the computer should just do it right so that is sort of the separation that it can do and it sounds like a tiny Im improvement um, but it helps you a lot if you do it often enough to define some templates for the things that otherwise we can um, we keep typing all over again so that's that um, this is the example of live templates and then of course your IDE regardless of which one you use comes with ton of tons of features for refactoring right you can refactor all many uh, all sorts of things the typical one is rename identifier right like rename this class so if I uh, would uh, rename this to um, some other class and do this that's a bad idea why now I get a compilation error because I just renamed these characters but I didn't rename the file and I might not rename all the references I have in my code base. Bad idea. So usually we don't do this. Of course, we tell our IDE to rename it and then we do it. So same idea, right? It makes a lot of sense to spend some time and to think really hard about what would be a good name for a class or a method, right? That represents the intention, um, intention really well. I know AI can now help a little bit with this, but that's actually a job for us humans to really think of, okay, what do we want to represent? So it makes, it makes sense to spend some time on that. But then to do actually the renaming and go through your code base with hundreds of files, that makes no sense, like because there is an IDE that is more reliable and faster. So that is sort of the separation. Renaming identifiers, for example, or the typical things we use all the time, for example, extract something to a variable, extract something for a method. I'm not talking about that you should learn by heart all of these uh, keyboard shortcuts and all of the refactoring features that are out there in your IDE because they're just too many. I also don't know them. And actually, I know a lot of creators by, uh, by JetBrains uh, personally who work on IDE IntelliJ and even they don't know all of the features that uh, the IDE ships with. But you should know the ones that you use all the time. So for example, what are the, the default ones? You know, like create something, create a class, generate some code, rename identifier, extract method, extract variable, extract parameter, all of these things. Luckily, your IDE got you covered there because the keyboard concept is pretty well thought out. For example, again, this is an IntelliJ example, extract variable, that's here, control, I always actually I, I do it so often that for me it's muscle memory I don't even think about what I'm typing here it's control alt M for extracting method V for vari variable F for field C for constant P for parameter right you get the idea so with these mnemonic keys it's easy uh, to remember and that is also what well what represents a well thought out keyboard concept that an application should have and luckily our IDEs do have them because they're really built for us developers but I'm going to go to the topic of, of the whole keyboard thing in a second. What I want to take away, you to take away for that, look for these potentials for automating, not just, not just think of automation like in a big process that you can automate, like some huge uh, shell scripts or programs, but even the small forums, things you do all the time manually, you know, very tiny things that you just do often enough that helps you. Some live templates, uh, some uh, keyboard shortcuts that you could press, if in the morning of the working session you always open up the same browser tabs or things like that or the same programs and you or order them in a specific workspace arrangement on your computer, you can automate that, right? Write a script and then it does everything while you can lean back and sip your coffee and the computer do, uh, does the work for you. So there's a lot of value in shell scripting or in, in scripting your way around things that you do all the time. So this is kind of, uh, kind of interesting and especially when we look into some Unix uh, environments or some environments that have a proper command line, uh, that is something we should really have a look at because the command line has a huge potential for automation and for doing things for us in general. So with um, command line, I usually talk about the Unix command line. So I use this Z shell uh, command line instead of bash here on my system. I'm here on a Linux system. Um, doesn't really matter on a Mac OS. Uh, I think nowadays they also ship with Z shell. Even on a um, on a Microsoft computer, you can get a proper command line these days. So uh, that's uh, something here. The command line when you get started out, it is a little bit daring. You know this uh, this the scary black window that doesn't have any UI. You just have to type basically. 
Um, some tips that make you more effective there. This whole topic, you know, we could talk for multiple days actually to uh, to give you good ideas how to work this uh, effectively. But the command line is a pretty nice tool. Some tips to get started a little bit better. As a Java developer specifically, what are the typical command line commands you type all the time, right? Something like Maven clean package, right? Or maybe Maven clean install, or maybe just Maven package, or maybe Maven clean install and uh, skip the tests, right? Something like this. That's what you type all the time. So one of the first uh, uh, tips here is to use same idea what we just had, something like a template called alias in order to make this faster. You know, to type Maven clean package, Maven clean install, Maven clean package and skip the tests, or maybe Maven clean package, Maven test skip. Who knows the difference? Yeah. Yes, the last one doesn't even compile the tests. The first one only doesn't run the test. So if you have a huge refactoring and your tests don't even compile anymore, use the second command and you know, you're ready for production, right? So uh, you can use that. But these are the things that we type all the time. And if you type them all the time, just define an alias for that. I um, have some pointer material how to do that on specific shells. But just it's that same way of thinking, right? Even if you would you'd, uh, use a different program, you're thinking about it. Hey, I'm typing these strings all the time. I make typos and you know it's annoying so just do this. Same for any other tools, you know, if you say you use git a lot on a command line. I actually I do. You know, git status, git commit, git push, whatever you want to have, just automate that. Same for tools like Docker, you know, like Docker PS, uh, Docker Run, Kube Control, you know, Kube, Kube Control get services, whatever you have. You know, you can have as a tip, you can have a look at your um, bash or z shell uh, history. And then, you know, grab sort by usage and you see what are the commands you type all the time and where it really makes sense to de define an alias for that. So that's really, really helpful. And well, then, of course, there are many other things on the command line to consider. So first of all, scripting with the command line can be really easy because at the very basic, what you can do, well, I would like to have a script to, for example, build and run my software. And it's very simple. You just say bin bash, and then you type the commands that you otherwise would type into your shell. Here, one after another, you make the file executable, and you're done, right? Something like maybe clean package. Maybe you have something like a Docker build, you know, my image. Maybe then you do a Docker run, and so on and so forth. You know, just as an example, this now won't run, but I can write this file. I can make it executable, and then I can execute it. There's already a lot of value in this, right? Because then it just runs and I can lean back and drink my coffee while these steps are performed one after another. So there's a lot of value in that. And then, of course, you know, you can go deeper. You can have a look at the bash syntax and do some if else and some checking if your service is running and all of that. You know, you can do this bit by bit. But also for me, I'm not a bash ex expert. I, I've written hundreds of bash grids, but I still have to Google the syntax for if else every single time because it's just. It's just a not, not a nice uh, scripting language. I don't know. But it works really well. There's a lot of value in doing these things. And especially on a Linux computer, you can automate everything in the command line. That's really cool. Like literally everything. I've, you know, sometimes uh, my mouse is really annoying, so I have a script that moves it out of the way just, you know, just because. And things like that that you can trigger. So that, that's really helpful. Same with if you want to arrange something on your system. If you say, I want to open up my workspaces here, one, two, three, arrange the browser, the IDE, the command line. When I start up my development session, when you work for different projects and things like that, that's so cool to just automate stuff. So there's a lot of value in, in that. And then just, you know, over time you, you improve because once you write a script, then you can use it all the time. That's just, I think, really, really nice and helpful. All right. Then for the command line, I don't want to go uh, too much into it because of time. But uh, one more tip I want to show you, also same intention, is what I call shell shortcuts. Um, what is a shortcut? Maybe you know this command. It's called clear. So it just clears the screen. Very easy. Um, but you can instead do Control L. That probably works on your shell. It's just a little bit faster, right? But then again, don't stop there. You can define your own commands for things you type even more often or that you do even more often. An example for that is something like this, right? Like something, some combination of an ls command, or maybe you have the L for just you know, display the current files and directories. So you can do this. I define Control K, because it's next to L. 
and then I clear and um, display the current directory. Or J for display the current hierarchy. Now it scrolls here. So with this, you're just really fast in navigating. Or, for example, git status, I do a lot, so I have control G that just showed me the current uh, status of what I've done here. Right? Same idea, you can just get uh, very uh, quick with this. Or, you know, control T for insert the current date. Um, why? Because I use, I use actually, it sounds crazy, but I don't use a file explorer anymore. I use the command line for pretty much everything, also, you know, moving and copying my files around. So if, for example, I say I have, let's take the whatever license file, and I would like to uh, rename this uh, to have the current date. I just, you know, do something like that to m rename this into uh, that particular file. I do this with documents, so you can just, you know, insert the current date. All of that can be done with with shortcuts, right? So that's uh, quite straightforward. All right. Now, as another principle, and which is also interesting to think about, I want you to. Well, think about to minimize these context switches. Um, what do you mean by that? With context switches, we probably think about CPUs, you know, that have a uh, context switch penalty to pay when they operate on executing one uh, task or one process, and then they have to switch the context and you know uh, clear the pipeline and uh, all the registers and things like that. Um, and the same is true for us humans when we're working on something and then we have a context switch, you know, either we get an interruption by a coworker or something like this, then all of these temporary, uh, these things that we hold in our temporary working um, brain, in our memory, um, are cleared and we're just less effective. But also there are context switches, um, like in big and in small forms, that sometimes occur during your work, while you're working on something, caused by inefficient setups. For example, if you have a tool that is not that nice to, to work with, where, for example, you cannot use a many nice keyboard shortcuts, or you have to switch back and forth, or you have to wait, have some waiting time. And uh, one thing I connect with that is actually to spend more time on the keyboard. Why? Because if I go to my IDE and say I'm typing, 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 and now, for example, you say, oh, I would like to, I don't know, rename this class. So I take my mouse, go here, right click, refactor, oh, come on, still asleep, refactor, you see how long this takes, uh, rename over there, right? And then I click here. And this is, this really bre breaks your flow, right? Because you were coding, 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 and now I have to, where is my mouse? Over there, you know, search for your mouse, wield it around, click to that. This is not efficient. So to, and this, in my, in my books, this represents a context switch or sort of like a short, a short break or breaks this flow experience of communicating with your c computer where instead you could use the keyboard. So why is the keyboard um, more efficient? Well, in this case it is. It actually depends on the task. I'm not saying use the keyboard for everything. Well, as a developer, maybe. But if you think, for example, if you would like to, I don't know, make some uh, Photoshop um, stuff, your mouse makes more sense, right? Or a computer game, you know, you need your mouse or even for, for browsing something on a website. So wherever there is a, I would say, limited set of actions, your keyboard makes a lot of sense. So, you know, typing is very limited because you have so and so many uh, characters to type. They're not infinite, you know, it's you, the, the, the commands that you can type and the actions that you press are quite finite. Um, there it really makes sense to use a keyboard and then also to get familiar with well the typical actions that you do we just uh, mentioned a lot of uh, IDE features like rename identifier or things like you know now build my software run my tests deploy this whole thing whatever you do you know you have typical tasks that you have and while as a challenge why you do them don't touch your mouse right so next time think about it as a develop in a development session Whenever you now touch your mouse, think about it, it's like, okay, wait a second, why do I have to touch the mouse? If it's some super exceptional use case when you say, I now have to trigger an action that I trigger once a year, you know, then it's fine, then you might not need to learn that extra shortcut or that extra um, automation. But typically, while I'm in the coding session, I don't want to touch my mouse. And this totally works, like there's no excuse, especially all the IDEs are really good at, I can do anything here. I can go um, to these different menus, I can say run, I don't know, run configuration, set the breakpoints, you can, you can control everything with the keyboard. And they are pretty well thought out keyboard concepts. This is not only true for the IDE and your editor, this is also true for the, key, uh, for the programs 
well, that you use all the time. Ideally, the programs that you use every day. For the programs like you know communication programs, emails, Slack, and things like that, it gets a little bit more trickier. Uh, one positive example is the Gmail uh, email client, like Gmail with the advanced keyboard something layout works really nicely. You can zap through your emails without touching the mouse, just you know with Vim like uh, bindings. That's really cool. Uh, with your IDE, it definitely works. With the other other tools, it depends. But just on a normal working session, it really makes you more effective to say, I can actually stay um, on that keyboard and not uh, move around here a lot. So how does this uh, connect, um, combine to context switches again? Well, I'm mostly talking about the switch from, it's mainly actually a hand positions, you know, like from typing, typing, typing. Ideally, you know, you should do touch typing, you know, without looking down, um, without actually changing that hand position. So another reason why what I, a few things that I want to talk about here, especially I know we are in Switzerland and Swiss people are even more crazy than the Germans when it comes to keyboard layouts. So, you know, Germans and Swiss, it's, a, it's, it's almost a wonder why we have so many developers here because if you look at the keyboard layout, you might think these people who created that layout don't like developers or vice versa. You know, if you try to type these curly braces and something like that, or, you know, any other uh, special characters, um, whatever have you, without making some weird dance, uh, dances and, you know, break dance movements with your hands is really difficult. Um, there's another topic on its own. I actually, um, I advise people to change the keyboard layout, I'm not kidding, uh, to a US uh, keyboard layout, and I mean the US international with alt uh, graphics and no dead keys. Uh, long name, why this specifically? Now all the French people and German people will, will shout at me and say, no, 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 we need to use our accents and our umlauts and all of the stuff, right? If you say I have my, how do you call all these characters, my ö and ü and this one, well, however they're called, right? You can still type them uh, with the US international keyboard layout. You just use the old graphics key with that. Of course, it is less efficient than just type these characters right away on your keyboard, same for a German keyboard. But as a developer, I claim we more often type the special characters than writing long sentences. You can also switch the keyboard layout, um, you know, and get used to that. What I now do, I just always use uh, this one and then the, the few times where I have to uh, type the special umlauts and, you know, sharp S and special characters, I just press them with, with this movement. I think that makes more sense, but at least, you know, you can have a look at that. So that's one thing. Um, another thing I want to point out is what you probably have seen why my uh, layout looks so weird. Weird. I use the Vim way of typing. I actually have a Vim, well, I have the editor here, but I also have a Vim plugin. And I want to tell you why. Because this Vim thing was probably one of the biggest improvements in productivity in, in my career, like no kidding. And I tell you why. I'm not even the biggest fan of the Vim editor. I don't care about the editor and I understand it's weird. Nobody knows how to access it and it's so confusing. And one of the reasons why it is so confusing is when you start it up, you cannot type, you know? Nothing happens. Why? Because the idea here, what you do, well, originally it was created because of some constraints in the keyboard layouting and everything, but now it works actually really well if you get into it. The idea is here that you can get rid of almost all of the hand movements and you don't need to context switch from, you know, moving your hands from here to there. What do I mean? Well, typically when you type, you know, you type, 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 then what happens? You switch your hand position down to the cursor arrows and you say, I want to go up here, down there, and, you know, now I want to go here to rename my class, right? And this is a little bit annoying. It's actually not super efficient if you think about it because now I have to change my hand position. Maybe I have to look down or maybe you feel when you slide your hand over the keyboard where the cursor arrows are or, you know, like insert, delete, all of these things. And this is I not ideal. If you think about a, a computer game, like especially these uh, first-person shooters where you move around, you know, with your mouse and one hand on the mouse, the other on the keyboard, the reason why you typically don't control them with the cursor arrows but with WASD is because, well, in that position, that part of the keyboard, you have more keys available, right? So you don't need to look down because in a computer, computer game you would l lose, right? In a video game if you cannot use your controls. So it's, it's really like that. Think of the movement here in the computer or the usability of your computer more like you would do in a video game. 
right? That you say it should become instant. It should become so natural for you that you do everything with muscle memory that you actually don't have to look down or have a lot of breaks in, in these movements. And that's a little bit what this editor al allows us to do. So the reason why this is so weird is we have multiple layers here of these movements or these text edit things. So when we start out, we are in the so-called normal mode and nothing happens here, but we could move around. Well, I don't have any text yet. So in order to type, I need to press a, se a separate character like I for insert, and then I can type, and then I can hit escape to go back, and then I can actually move around here. I can say, let me copy this a few times. I can move around, which then is a little bit like a computer game. So I know there's a very steep learning curve involved in it, and it may take some time to get used to it, but once you get used to it, it's actually very nice because you don't think about it anymore. You don't have that you know, break in, in, in this movement experience. It's, it's really more like moving into a, um, well, in a video game. And the good news is you don't have to use this crazy editor. You can actually use a lot of plugins for a lot of programs, especially all the IDEs come with some sort of Vim emulation. That's what I do here. That's also what, why my line, uh, lines are so weird. So this is a relative line movement, you know, a little bit like, like in a crosshair. Um, here, if I say I want to jump up here, that's three lines up relative to the current line. So I say, you know, up and down J and K. So I say, say three up and then I'm there. You know, or if I want to jump here and um, edit something, I want to jump there forward. It's, it's really nice. You can jump around quite nicely in your code. And once you get used to it, it's just much faster and much, and much nicer to use. Again, I'm not telling everybody has to le learn Vim. It is definitely interesting to have a look at it as a developer. And again, if you have a look at it, then probably you don't want to go back. But it is basically just implementing that same idea of allowing yourself to stay on that uh, keyboard position with your hands and remove these context switches. Like just do all of these things in that same efficient way how you would use um, a video game, basically. All right, and another thing that can represent a context switch when we use programs that is especially annoying are waiting times. So waiting times are really bad. And I know I say this as a relatively young person, so I'm a millennial and my generation is uh, said to be very impatient and especially the generation after us, you know, like this uh, TikTok insta uh, instant gratification uh, generation. So, you know, we don't want to wait. And actually, I think it's good. You shouldn't wait. Why? For all of us, this represents just the potential for distractions. And I mean it. So if we say we take Let's make a quick poll. How long does your Maven build or your uh, program build take, including all the tests? Is it more than two seconds? Hands up. Is it more than 10 seconds? Is it more than 30 seconds? Oh, God. Is it more than two minutes? OK, now I will stop. That's, that's, that's not acceptable. If you think about it, now this might sound crazy, but really, I mean it. If you have some action that takes, let's say, one second, that feels kind of, not instant, but it feels sort of okay. Actually, th there was a lot of research done to this, like 100 to 200 milliseconds is where something feels pretty much instant to us humans. Anything longer than that is already in danger zone. So one second is kind of like, um, okay, now I'm done. You know, you pretty much would wait for it. You press a key, you wait for an action, and okay, now we're done. My personal threshold is around two seconds. If I say, okay, now we're done. You know, I press a key, I'm like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay, now we're done. And this is not a lot, but actually if you think about it, if something takes only 10 seconds, you know, and a build with 10 seconds was pretty good, right? But if you say you want to build often and you, you know, run your tests and do all of these things while you're coding, and now I'm coding, 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 oh, let me run my tests. I actually haven't looked at my phone in a long time. Let me see what's new here on, uh, on email and Slack. And that's what happens. Then you very quickly are just distracted because you're not going to wait for that actively each and every time. So 10 seconds even is not acceptable at all, at least not for the things that you do while coding. So what is very important with the workflow that you build up while you're coding, while your hands are on your keyboard, you're writing code, you're reading code, you're executing some tests, you do all of these things, I don't want you to wait. Like the threshold should be two seconds. And good news is with modern 
technology that is possible. So there are some you know, tricks and tools around, such as dev tools. Um, the Quark is dev mode is pretty good at that. That's why I want to show you uh, this particular uh, demo project that I have. There's a so-called Quark is dev mode um, that we can start up that starts up your application very similar to you know, how your production application would run. Similar uh, thing available for Spring. In the Java world in general, there are a few tools there, even for other tools uh, that works quite well. And then what it does, you can just change something and see the change being reflected. For example, I have some Hello World coffee response that just says coffee. So if I say here, curl localhost um, 8080 coffee, it just says, you know, coffee. And if I change this to coffee, question mark, then it will just very quickly reload the code and then you get coffee, question mark. And when the question is coffee, of course, the answer is yes, please. So here you see it works. Well, this computer is now six years old almost, so it's sort of okay-ish on my other desktop computer that is quite new. It takes like 200 milliseconds to reload, so that's pretty, pretty much instant, which is just very nice. So, of course, just changing a string is not that interesting, but actually you can change anything. This is very advanced. It will detect all of your you know, class changes. If it cannot compile your code, it will just try again, try again. But it's not an advertisement session for Quarkus, although Quarkus is a very interesting technology, so you might want to check that out. But just in general, whatever technology you use, you should have a setup like that where you say, and it can involve, you know, some pragmatic shell scripts and some tinkering around and some duct tape, you know, locally, just to get you fa make you faster. It's even more important to set this up for your test environments. Why? Because well, I don't want to ask around how long your test suite runs, but typically that's also rather minutes, but it should be actually much less than that. A big problem that we have, well, it's not necessarily a problem, this is a bigger story, you know, in, in the Java, in the enterprise Java world is that we have a lot of technologies that sort of simulate some environment, such as, um, well, we have test containers, in the past we had Achillean and things like that, we have spring test and spring context test. The reason why I'm not a big, biggest fan of this is they tangle around with your life cycle of the tests and then they're always trying to start up everything. Which on the one hand is nice because that's easy to program and to start up, but then also they start up everything usually each and every time when you run a test. So you, when you hit that key to run your test, first of all it takes a few seconds until the whole thing actually starts up and then even for a single Hello World test you're at least in five seconds. Um, what I would like to have, actually with Quark is you can start this up very quickly. I have a test, a uh, unit test that now failed because I changed that string, but I can ru run this again, run this again, you see my key press and it runs the whole thing in a few milliseconds. Well, you know, it keeps everything compiled in the background, but that is actually the response that I want. I change something here, you know, I change my code and it's already green because it keeps it running. So I say, I run it again, run it again, runs very quickly. Okay, this is just one test, but plain JUnit is very quick. You can run a few hundreds of tests in just a few milliseconds. If it doesn't do anything, it, if it doesn't tangles around with your, with your um, life cycle, this is even faster. But what you can also do, I have another integration test, exclude pattern, um, that is typically excluded because it's called IT. That's the typical uh, maybe you know about this, that's the naming scheme of, uh, of Maven. If you have a test that ends with IT for integration test, it's excluded per default. You have to run your test differently. And what it does, it connects to my running system as a client, localhost 8080, and then, you know, ask for the coffee. And then if I run this in my IDE, when my IDE wakes up, it runs the whole test, and this is quite quick. But you can run the same thing now here in your Quarkus development mode. If I run this here, and now it runs it in really just a few milliseconds. Why? It is just an HTTP call that connects to the already running application. So I, I, I do this a little bit differently. I say I'm fine with waiting a little bit longer in the beginning. You know, in the beginning of my coding session, I fire up all the applications. Maybe I need a database. I actually have a database that is running here locally. So a Postgres database runs in Docker. And I'm fine with waiting for two minutes until that starts up. But during my coding session, while my hands are on the keyboard, don't make me wait. So I really want to have an experience like that. Like, let's play this through. I change something here in my production code. I say coffee question mark. I say go back. So now uh, this unit test fails, of course. So I fix the, where is it? 
I fix that unit test. I say, okay, equals to coffee exclamation mark. This runs the code directly and checks the string. Now I run the whole thing. Now my integration test connects to it, says, okay, it fails. You know, and I change this here as well. And you get the point. It's even faster than I could talk. It's, it's just doing things the whole time. It doesn't make me wait. So I don't have to rebuild everything. I don't have to restart my application. It just runs in this way. And again, this was just one particular example for a technology, but during your coding workflow, don't wait. Like, you know, not even for more than two seconds. Set up, um, set up a workflow that works in such a way. I have some more examples uh, that I can point you to, especially for enterprise testing in Java. But with any technology nowadays, this works pretty well that you can just set up something. I mean, the uh, web development had this for years, right? That you have some sort of um, whatever browser sync and you just reload and it's just there. And you, it's such a nice experience to just code change something and you see the changes immediately being reflected. So that's, that's really nice. But let's move on a little bit for other principles and other parts of our work that are now not that much part of the work, so, um, but instead external. There are a lot of other things that derail us from work and want to steal our flow experience. And one thing is just distractions. And distractions can be, well, anything. Basically anything that distracts you. Well, it can be a sound, can be the light, can be some sort of um, uh, noise level, the temperature, kids that are running around, anything that is sort of external to your work. These things are really bad. Phone, you know, probably the worst invention for that kill your, your flow experience. Um, the short story with that is distractions won't go away by themselves. You just have to actively manage them. You have to, you know, turn them off. Basically, that means, you know, turning off Slack, turning off email, Turning your phone, there's a great phone on every feature, Android and iPhone. It's called Flight Mode. Works great. Won't have any distractions afterwards. You don't get any messages. That's amazing. And then you can focus. And I'm quite deliberate with this. And you say it's easy for me to say I'm, I'm self-employed. Uh, no, but even when you work, uh, or especially when you work with a team, just have these expectations being managed that you say, Hey folks, I need to work on something here. You know, don't I won't read your messages. And the, the actually the easiest thing is to just be in flight mode to close everything so nobody can message you. But this is more about expectation management. If you say, hey, I need to work on this thing, usually it's totally fine to tell people, I will go back to you, but within let's say 30 minutes or within 60 minutes, right? So I will respond to your message, but give me a window in which I'm just fully offline, and then within that response time, I'll get back to you. Right? And then you can set yourself a timer. Timers are great tools for this, you know, because they really allow you to get into the flow. You say, you know something will wake you up. So you just set a, uh, a timer for 60 minutes. You close everything. Actually, a nice benefit when you close Slack, you get a lot of computing resources back. You know, all of this memory that is not consumed anymore by the computer. And then you can just focus. That's a really nice way that works um, really well. And another thing is related to your time in general. So the more you get into this idea, especially when we're working from home or when we have more agency about when we spend the time on what, is to, well, be more deliberate with your time. So for example, most of us have this during the day that we are more effective or just have more energy at certain uh, periods in, in the day. Very often in the morning, for example, or after you have had some rest in the afternoon or something like this, you have more energy and then you can just ideally spend these, this time frame on something that is high value work, you know, where I can really focus, where I can solve that complicated problem, where I can fix that complicated bug and things like that. But very often then we get these meeting requests and say, okay, now you have to have this meeting at this time and this really rips apart your whole day or half of your day. And you can and should be quite deliberate with this and actually nothing bad happens if you decline a meeting request. Like, you know, usually you won't get fired immediately, especially if you have a good response to that. If you say, hey, you know, sorry, but I really want to get that feature uh, going here and you really need to focus on this. And we know how it goes. If you have just five minutes or even just 30 minutes of a meeting, then typically at least two hours are trashed for, you know, just before time, after time, when you just need to be back on speed. And you're not that effective that half of the day. Pretty much half of the day then is lost because of one meeting. So being more deliberate helps with this. And again, it's mostly about communication and expectation management. So typically you can, it works to do this. 
And connected to that is what really helps you also once in a while to actively take a step back and reflect what I like to do actually at the end of every day. And it doesn't take long, like two minutes. Just ask yourself, <laughs> actually, what did I do today? That's already a really good question. Um, what went well? What didn't go well? And is there something I could improve? And once you allow yourself to step back, then it's actually when you see all of this potential, it's like, oh yeah, wait a second, now for the third time I did everything here in the same way, this could be automated. Or we're really struggling with this um, idea now, maybe we should document something for, for the next person or for the future self to improve something. So once you allow yourself to reflect and to step back, then you will see a lot of improvement and then you can work on that. That's really, really helpful. And connected uh, to that, of course, is to learn and to keep learning. So we're not done, even once we are senior developers. Actually, this you know, rabbit hole of IT is pretty much infinite, so you can keep learning, and which is great. You know, there are new horizons to be learned, new things to be discovered, new languages, technologies, stacks. It's really nice, and these things, of course, make us more effective, as we know, especially as technology moves up the extract, uh, abstraction layer. Right? So nowadays, writing an HTTP service with some database connection, that's a matter of a few classes and a bunch of annotations. Right? It's easy once you know which annotations to put there and how to configure everything, right? And that's just a question of knowledge. So that is definitely something that is true. And very much connected to that, sharing knowledge is pretty much the best way to learn. Um, not just for anybody else, also for your future self. If you learn and if you share that knowledge, and can be any way, you know, can be pair programming, can be a session, can be a blog post that you write, um, internal session in your company, your knowledge will improve. So this is, this is a really nice way as well. And all of these ideas are connected to the thought of just continuously improve, you know, continuous improvement. Because every automation you create or shortcut you learn, every documentation you write and then don't have to do it again, well, everything that you learn is a long-term investment. So think really long-term investments here and they will definitely help you improving on your, on your journey to, be, uh, to become more productive as a developer. So these are the principles I wanted to share uh, with you. So again, these things are not really tied to a specific language or tool, although they are connected to Java, at least the things um, I wanted to show um, to you. But you can pretty much do them for any stack, for any language, if you just apply them, especially automation, and try to minimize these context switches mm. and also the other things here as well but I have one more thing because usually I would just like to you know you can take a picture of this list and just you know remind yourself every day but this time I did something else to just really help you reminding these things so instead of just having a list I wrote you a poem so maybe that helps in just reminding these points so a poem. I know we're in a, uh, you know, in a science space, but maybe also some, you know, some language culture is appreciated here. A developer's quest to productivity. Do you feel unproductive? You can't get anything done? You're caught in a lot of meetings, but you'd love to code and have fun. There are so many distractions, phone, email, and Slack. You would love to focus and get some of your time back. You're in a noisy environment. Your build feels so slow. You have to wait forever for your test and you're not in the flow. You can turn that around. It doesn't have to be that way. You can have a productive time and effective workflow, okay? Throw out all distractions. They won't go away by their own. Close Slack and your email. Turn off your phone. Automate the boring repetitive tasks, left and right, day and night. The computer is fast, we humans are smart. A dream team, if you do it right. Context switches back and forth are bad. So are waiting times. They're annoying and distracting. And, a big, and big warning signs for inefficient setups. So make it fast, your coding workflow, by design. And you're a developer, use the keyboard, shortcuts, and the command line. Decline that all hands, all hands meeting, 
Take back control of your time. No one will complain. Things will be fine. Journal every day and write down how it went. Make plans and be deliberate about your time, my friend. Reflect and step back to see clear the issues big and small because you can't see a picture when you're too close to the wall. Also share what you know in blog posts, sessions, videos, whatever format preferred, as knowledge is one of the few things that increases when shared. From learning every day, skills, efficiency, and also fun is what we yield. So continuously improve as long as we are in this field. With all that, you can be productive. There's no need to cry. So remember these points, and thank you. Goodbye.